Welcome to a geometry lesson on properties of parallelograms. I'm Mr. Pi the Math Guy and I'm going to be your host today. So let's go right ahead and get into this. The properties of parallelograms are expressed or displayed or called theorems. In this particular theorem, we have the opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. You don't need to be a geometry student to understand this. You don't need to be a geometry student to have learned this before. The opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent. So we know that they're parallel and we know that they are congruent. Here's some other cool things about parallelograms. The angles of a poly polygon that share a side are consecutive angles. For this particular parallelogram, there are four pairs of consecutive angles. What are they? One pair of consecutive angles would be A and B. Another pair would be B and D. A third pair would be D and C. And the final pair would be C and A. And to go along with this idea of opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent, we can also say that consecutive angles are supplementary. So if you're asked to solve problems involving opposite sides of a parallelogram, you're going to make an equation that has the two sides being equal to one another. If you're dealing with a problem in which you're dealing with consecutive angles of a parallelogram, you'll take the two measures of those angles, add them together, and they'll be equal to 180 degrees. So let's see how we can use this theorem and this idea of consecutive angles to solve problems. Example 1. Use parallelogram KMOQ to find the measure of angle O. We're given the measure of angle Q right here, and we're being asked to find the measure of angle O. Q and O, as we saw in the previous slide, are consecutive angles, which means they are supplementary. So what we could write down is this, the measure of angle Q plus the measure of angle O is equal to 180 degrees. Again, consecutive angles of a parallelogram are supplementary. And that's because this shared side, these angles that are on the same side, are on a transversal crossing two parallel lines, which makes them same side interior angles, and they are supplementary. So now we simply substitute and solve. And for the measure of angle Q, I'll substitute in 35 degrees plus the measure of angle O is equal to 180. Now we subtract 35 from each side. This is a very basic equation to solve. On the left-hand side, the 35s become 0, leaving us the measure of angle O being equal to 180 take away 35. 180 take away 35. 145. So the measure of angle O for this particular parallelogram, KMOQ, is 145 degrees. The next property in this theorem is the idea that opposite angles of a parallelogram are congruent, very similar to the idea that opposite sides are congruent. So for this particular diagram, what we have to figure out are what are the opposite angles. Well. A and B are consecutive angles, and A and D are consecutive angles. Therefore, A and C must be opposite angles. So, what we'll conclude from this theorem for this diagram is that angle A is congruent to angle C, and we can conclude that angle B is congruent to angle D. There's a couple ways you can go ahead and prove that theorem. For now, it's just going to be useful for us to be able to understand and implement this theorem in some problem-solving situations. Example 2. Find the value of x in parallelogram A, B, C, D, then find the measure of angle A. Well, in this parallelogram A, B, C, D, two opposite angles are labeled. Angle B is labeled as x plus 15, and angle C is labeled as 135 minus x. Angle B and angle C are 
opposite angles, therefore they are congruent. So the equation we should write for this particular problem, since they are congruent, we should write them as equal. So we'll write down x plus 15, which is the measure of angle B, is equal to 135 minus x. Now we solve this particular equation. It's an equation that has variables on both sides, so we will, in this case, I will add x to both sides. That will eliminate the x on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have x plus x, which would give us 2x. I bring down the plus 15. I bring down the equal sign. I bring down the 135. Next, I solve this two-step equation by subtracting 15 from each side. The 15s on the left cancel, leaving 2x on the left of the equal sign. On the right of the equal sign, 135 take away 15 is 120. And I finally divide each side by 2. So the value of x is equal to 60. That's not the measure of angle B or angle C. That's the value of x. Now we've been asked to find, well this is our one answer, it says find the value of x. Now we need to find the measure of angle A. To do that we first need to find the measure of angle B. And we do measure of angle B by substituting x into x plus 15. Or substituting 60 into x into the x plus 15. So 60 plus 15 is equal to 75. So the measure of angle B is 75. To find the measure of angle A, we rely on the fact that A and B are consecutive angles, which means they are supplementary. So the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B will be equal to 180. Substituting in what we know, the measure of angle A is what we're calculating, plus 75 degrees, and that's going to be equal to 180, and we solve this by simply subtracting 75 from both sides. On the left-hand side, the 75s cancel out, leaving us the measure of angle A, and on the right-hand side, 180 take away 75 is 105. So the measure of angle A is 105. Another theorem dealing with parallelograms has to do with the diagonals of the parallelogram. The diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other. By bisect each other, by definition, means they cut themselves in half or into two equal parts. So from this, in this parallelogram, A, B, C, D, we have the diagonal A, C, and we have the diagonal B, D, and they meet at the point X. So this theorem, what it means is that segment AX is going to be congruent to segment XC, and segment DX is going to be congruent to segment XB. Notice it doesn't say they are congruent to each other. It doesn't say anything about relating them to each other. It just says that they bisect each other, which means they cut each other into two equal parts. So let's take a look at how this theorem can be used in problem solving. Example 3 asks us to find the values of x and y in parallelogram KLMN. Well, the values of x and y are on the diagonals of parallelogram KLMN. And we can see here the diagonal KM is labeled 2x plus 5 and 5y. So we can make an equation out of them. So I'm going to go ahead and make that first equation right now out of that, that's going to be 5y is equal to 2x plus 5. Now the reason I can write that equation is because these two expressions are on the diagonal that's bisected by this diagonal. Now the other equation that I can write is based on these two expressions being on the same diagonal. So in this case I'm going to write down the equation x is equal to 7y minus 16. I know this causes a lot of problems for my students because they forget about solving systems of equations. When you have two equations that have two variables, you have to solve a system. 
And to solve this system, what I do is first off, I label my equations. My first equation I'll call 1. My second equation I'll call 2. And that just helps me keep things together. Now, you're going to need to understand solving a system of equations by substitution. The reason substitution is the best choice here is because the equation 2, the one I have written in red, is already solved for x. So what I'm going to do is take equation 1 and substitute this part of it in for the x. I'm going to do that down here. So this is going to be my equation 1, but now I'm going to substitute. It's going to be 5y is equal to 2 times 7y minus 16 plus 5. Well, now we solve this equation. Now that I substituted this expression, 7y minus 16, into that x, I solved the equation for y. First I distribute 2 times 7y and 2 times minus 16. 2 times 7y is 14y. 2 times minus 16 is minus 32. And I bring the rest of the equation down. Next, I combine these two like terms, negative 32 plus 5. Well, that gives me a minus or a negative 27. Negative 32 plus 5 is negative 27. And I bring the rest of the equation down. I next subtract 14y from both sides. The reason I do that is because I have variables on both sides. The 14y minus 14y on the right cancels out. And I bring down my negative 27 on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, I go 5y, take away 14y, which gives me a negative 9y. Next, I divide each side by negative 9. The negative 9's on the left divide out, leaving me with y isolated. On the right-hand side, the answer is 3, because negative 27 divided by negative 9 is 3. So the first part of my solution here is y is equal to 3. I take that value, then and substitute it into one of the original equations. I'm going to use equation 2 in this case, which is x is equal to 7y minus 16. The reason I'm using this equation is because it's already solved for x. So I'm going to take this 3 and substitute it in for y to give me x is equal to 7 times 3 minus 16. 7 times 3 is 21 minus 16 and 21 minus 16 is 5. So the two solutions here, y is equal to 3 and x is equal to 5. Of course, we could take these values, put them back in, and find the actual lengths, but we're not asked to do that. That's for another day. Here's another theorem. If three or more parallel lines cut off congruent segments on one transversal, then they cut off congruent segments on every transversal. So here we have our three blue parallel line segments. Our transversals are here in black. Now the transversal on the left-hand side is cut into two equal parts by these three parallel lines. Therefore, because of this theorem, we can conclude that this other black transversal is cut into two equal parts, or two congruent parts, by these three parallel lines. Let's take a look at how we can use this theorem to solve some problems. Here in example four, we're given a crazy looking diagram, and it says in the figure to the right, Line DH is parallel to line CG, which is parallel to line BF, which is parallel to line AE. Then it tells us that a, the length of segment AB is equal to the length of segment BC, which is equal to the length of segment CD, which is equal to 3. And we can see that in the diagram. These parallel lines cut this transversal into equal parts. Then it tells us that the length of segment EF is 4.5. What we have to do is find the length of EH. So we want to find the length from here to here. Since this transversal was cut into equal parts by the four parallel lines, this transversal will also be cut into equal parts by the theorem we just read. So the length of FG is 4.5. The length of GH is also 
So we can calculate the length of EH in a couple ways. We could add 4.5 to itself three times, or we could multiply it by three. We could take 4.5 and multiply it by three. Three times five is 15, carry the one. Three times four is 12, plus one is 13. And since 4.5 has one decimal place, our answer must. So here, the answer or the solution to what's asked is the length of segment EH is 13.5. This has been Mr. Polarski working with properties of parallelograms, diagonals, and transversals. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.